Hello, I'm Barry Shore, Professor Emeritus at the University of New Hampshire and Head of Content Development here at SSGI. Supply chain managers build expertise in at least 12 skills, ranging from the ability to draw value stream maps or flowcharts to the increasing complexities of reverse logistics, including the importance of maintaining a network that is capable of continuously improving in the face of constant change. This brief guide covers the very basics in each of these 12 areas. But first, some background. The COVID-19 pandemic made supply chain a household word. It became apparent to many people that there was a fragile link between the companies from which products and services were purchased, which we will call the focal firm, and their suppliers. Cargo ships backed up in ports, and shortages appeared everywhere from automobiles to furniture, toys, and bicycles. And they had a profound impact. Accenture reported that 94% of Fortune 1000 companies reported supply chain disruptions. Indeed, break one link in a whole supply chain network like the computer chips used in cars, and that disruption can halt or significantly reduce process output. Why have organizations become so dependent on their supply chains? Instead, why not avoid most suppliers and process everything within the focal firm? The reason is that most firms operate in competitive markets and have learned to focus on what they do best called their core competence. Almost everything else becomes a candidate for outsourcing. Apple and Lululemon are examples. They outsource all manufacturing and rely on their expertise in managing very complex global supply chains. In short, this explains the explosion in supply chains and especially global sourcing in recent times. How can we effectively manage a supply chain? One way to begin is by drawing a value stream map. It can help illustrate the flow of products and information from beginning to end. The details vary with each situation and these maps may extend back over several suppliers and continue to warehouses and distribution centers. Above all, the process of drawing the map is an opportunity to bring stakeholders together and ensure that everyone agrees on the structure and flow across the current process. Here is an example of a value stream map for a company that delivers frozen meals to its customers. The second issue is integration. It represents the interconnectedness across the network where all partners work together to achieve supply chain goals. What needs to be avoided in this situation is when major players in the network act on their own and primarily focus on their own needs. When that happens, each organization is referred to as an independent silo. Instead, it is the role of the supply chain manager to ensure that these players cooperate with the focal firm to create a collaborative environment where everyone works together to achieve network goals. It requires the integration of supply chain strategies, management practices, forecasts, schedules, deliveries, and quality. Inventory management is an especially critical issue. Without it, the supply chain could not function. It contributes to the operation, integration, and smooth functioning of the network. And it is pervasive. Suppliers hold inventory. The focal firm holds inventory. Warehouses hold inventory. And distribution centers hold inventory. And the goods being shipped between entities are classified as inventory. But managing it is complex. When there is too much inventory at any stage, there is waste. And when there is too little, there can be stockouts and lost sales. 
As a result, the supply chain manager must ensure that a balance is struck between these two extremes. But inventory strategy can change across a network because there are different ways that the network can respond to customer demand. For example, inventory strategy changes across the network when a custom car such as a Cooper Mini or when a meal at a three-star Michelin restaurant is ordered. In both, a significant portion of the operational process only begins after an order is placed. While some inputs follow traditional rules of inventory management, such as storing condiments or vegetables, there is some point in the process where the assembly of the finished product draws items from inventory but assembles them to meet customer specifications. Logistics is the process of moving goods from one location to another. In a world that is more and more competitive, not only must response be quick, but logistics is often a critical part of the firm's competitive strategy. Amazon, for example, was a disruptive force in online retailing when it introduced same-day and one-day shipping. And they have invested so dramatically in their own logistics systems that it has been very difficult for others to keep pace. Cycle time is the time between placing an order and receiving it. It is a concept that applies across the entire supply chain. There are several points at which cycle time can be measured. One example is the cycle time between the receipt of an order by a supplier and the delivery of that order to another supplier or to the focal firm. Another is the overall cycle time, which measures how long it takes from the receipt of a customer order to its delivery to the end user or customer. The challenge is to identify where delays occur, determine how they can be addressed, and then implement the changes. The goal is to design and manage the network in such a way as to minimize cycle time across all supply chain partners and in the process, minimize overall cycle time from order to customer delivery. One of the most challenging and important steps when managing a supply chain network is to find the right or best suppliers. It is called sourcing. First, potential suppliers are identified. Then it must be determined if their core competencies are sufficient to meet needs. Next, manufacturing costs are compared and shipping costs are estimated, confirming that their overhead costs are not a significant burden and will not interfere with their continuing performance. In some situations, such as the consideration of an overseas supplier, it will be necessary to ensure that macroeconomic factors like exchange rates will not change dramatically and ensure that political factors will not jeopardize their ability to deliver. Supply chains, as we have learned, are subject to risks that can affect quality and delivery. In recent times, the COVID-19 pandemic and its effect on the ability of supply chains to meet their delivery obligations has reminded us that these risks are very real and that they need to be managed. Managing risk begins with an assessment of risk exposure. Where are the vulnerabilities? How often is a risk event likely to occur and how damaging might it be? Then we focus on risk mitigation. Is it possible to take steps to avoid or mitigate the risks and what will be the cost? If a risk event does occur, then what steps can be taken to mitigate the damage? Integration relies on the relationship between parties in the network and the information they are willing to share. Several information-based software technologies are used, beginning with the simple Kanban system 
extending to an Enterprise Resource Planning System, ERP, and continuing with a supply chain management system and even a customer resource management system. When the partnership is strategic, it will be necessary to ensure real-time access to information across the entire network and thereby facilitate the communication necessary to integrate activities across the network. Supplier relationships represent another important piece of the supply chain puzzle. Certainly, the relationships between supply chain professionals within the focal firm matter. They need to develop working relationships among themselves with an emphasis on shared supply chain goals. But we must also consider the relationships between the focal firm and other players in the network, especially key players or strategic partners. They too must establish effective working relationships with each other. In fact, if the network is to be a high performance network, then the players in that network must perform as a high performance team where they work together to not only solve problems, but also to identify new opportunities. Indeed, without effective relationships, supply chain optimization can be difficult, if not impossible to achieve. Here is a point that deserves emphasis and repeating. Without proper relationships across key players in the network, the supply chain is more likely to perform as a collection of independent silos. End user or customer demand eventually drives all stages in the supply chain. And in a perfect world, demand for finished products and services would be predictable and steady. Placing orders with suppliers, scheduling, quality assurance, and logistics would all be relatively simple because every partner in the supply chain would know exactly what they needed to deliver and when it should be delivered. As a result, they could simply focus on quality and cycle times. Unfortunately, a perfect world does not exist. Demand does indeed vary, and supply chain managers need to consider strategies to absorb these fluctuations while still maintaining some stability in the process itself. While in the end, customer demand is mostly out of their control, there still remain strategies to manage and smooth these fluctuations so that there can be a reasonable level of efficiency in the supply chain network. These strategies are part of a topic called demand management, which focuses on balancing demand and supply. Returns are an inevitable part of a supply chain. They seldom, if ever, can be avoided, and they are costly to process. But returns do not only incur costs, they also have advantages. They can contribute to the overall performance of the company. For example, a liberal return policy such as that followed by Walmart or Amazon can increase customer loyalty, raise overall profits, and enhance the company's brand. There are four types of returns. The first is customer returns, such as those made by Walmart customers after discovering that the item purchased does not meet their expectations. The second is marketing returns, when a product that is already downstream in the supply chain must be returned due to slow sales, quality issues, or the need to reposition inventory. The third is product recalls, and the fourth is environmental returns, when a product is found to inflict harm to the environment. All four types need to be managed. Once a supply chain network has been designed and optimized, there are changes that will still need to be made. These changes may result from actions taken by competitors, recommendations for product improvements suggested by supply chain partners, customer complaints, 
changes in product design, technology innovation, or from changes in the information system. So the supply chain manager must be willing and capable to take steps to continually improve the network. Certainly one of the challenges will be resistance to change. But reflecting this continuous nature of change and the challenges associated with it, many organizations establish formal continuous improvement positions in the focal firm. If you have found the material in this guide interesting and useful, you might consider becoming professionally qualified as a certified supply chain specialist. You probably have two questions in mind. How difficult will it be and how long will it take? The answer depends upon several factors. First, it depends upon where you begin. Once you have completed this guide, you are already well on your way. The full course, including the certification exam, should take no more than one month as long as you are willing to put in a few hours each evening. To accommodate your busy schedule, both the course and certification exam offered by SSGI are online and can be accessed at your convenience. For more information on this course and the other process control and leadership courses offered by SSGI, click on the link below. Thanks for watching.